We all know that nothing magically changes when we flip the calendar from December 31st to January 1st. Our habits don't change, and the good or bad situations that we've been facing, they're still with us. When the ancient Israelites were trying to figure out how God was at work in their lives, the prophet Jeremiah spoke words of hope. God wanted a new covenant that was written on their hearts. You can read those ancient words by looking up Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And in today's message, our senior pastor, McGray de Vega, explores an early ritual from the Methodist movement, the Covenant Renewal Service, that draws on these themes from Jeremiah. This service can give our year prior and our year ahead focus and purpose. Check it out. Let us pray. O oh God, open our eyes to empathy, curiosity, and humility, that we might be generous and compassionate toward others and ourselves. Amen. The start of a new year always reminds me of one of my most vivid childhood memories. Every New Year's Eve, my parents would call me and my two brothers together about 15 minutes before midnight to observe what they said was a Filipino tradition. First, they said, every light must be on. The more lights that are on in the house, the greater the joy and happiness that we'll be experiencing in the coming year. Filipino tradition, they said. So, with minutes to go before midnight, my brothers and I would scurry around the house, turning on every light we could find. I mean, literally every single light. The lamps, the night lights, the aquarium light, the oven light, even the refrigerator and microwave door lights. If it had a bulb, it got switched on. And then, with seconds before the big moment, my mom would shove coins into our pockets and dollar bills into our hands. She said that if we had money in our pockets and in our hands, it would bring the promise of wealth in the upcoming year. So we stuffed our pockets and hands with money. Then, as we watched the ball drop on Times Square, she, she then told us that exactly at midnight we needed to leap high into the air. That would bring us the promise of physical health and growth in the upcoming year. So we did. It was a fun ritual, something we always looked forward to. And it was neat to think that Filipinos around the world were turning on lights and jumping with money. Years later in college, I was talking to some Filipino-American friends on campus and we were swapping fun stories about our families and that's when I brought up the whole New Year's thing. And my friend's faces went blank. Do you mean you don't turn on every light switch in the house? They shook their heads, no. Or the money in your pockets or the jumping in the air? Nope. It turns out that all these years, this wasn't a Filipino thing. This was a Mike and Tessie De Vega thing. This was a let's see what else we can make the kids do thing. So if you're wondering if I ever had Grace and Maddie do this stuff when they were little, you bet I did, because it's fun to make your kids do stuff. It's true that there is nothing magical or mystical about a mere flip of the calendar or strike of midnight. After all, not every culture celebrates the new year on the same day of the year. People from Thailand, Cambodia and Laos celebrate their new year in April. Jewish people observe Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, sometime every September. Even Christians, liturgically, do not start their church calendar year on January 1st, but on the first week of Advent, which is always four weeks before Christmas. And even that has not always been the case. During the Middle Ages, Christians advocated for the new year starting on December 25th in honor of the birth of Jesus. And then they changed the new year to March 25th, nine months before Jesus' birth, when he was conceived on a day they called the Annunciation. Now, this is all to say that there is nothing magical or suddenly transformative about a simple flip of the calendar. But... The new year does prompt an opportunity, doesn't it? It gives us a chance to conduct a personal inventory on our lives, to reflect on the past year, 
to reevaluate our, our perspectives and our behaviors, and to recommit to becoming a better person and even a more faithful Christian. John Wesley and his followers never did the light bulb or money or jumping thing, but they did use the start of each year to reflect, reevaluate, and recommit their lives to God. In 1755, in a small village church outside London, Methodists conducted a worship service that would become an annual tradition at the start of every new year. It would be called the Covenant Renewal Service. And over time, it would grow in popularity among Methodist circles around the world, and is something that we are observing today. We join with Methodists around the world to start this new year with a time of confessing our sins, recommitting our lives to Jesus, and choosing to be faithful to God every day for the upcoming year. But here is the one big caveat that we need to remember. Simply doing these important spiritual activities at the start of the new year offers no guarantee for what your year will bring. Confessing our sins and recommitting our lives to Jesus is not like turning on light switches or pocketing money or jumping into the air at the stroke of midnight. As I've often said throughout my tenure here at the church, God is not a giant vending machine and no proper combination of actions or button pushing or coin counting will get you the sudden benefit that you were expecting. And renewing our commitment to God is not like some typical New Year's resolution that is all up to you to break or keep. We are only responsible for our own choices to be faithful to God. And that means leaving the outcome of the year ahead to God. I mean, you might find yourself reflecting back on 2022 and thinking, now, wait a minute. I did my very best all last year to be a faithful Christian. I made strides in my spiritual journey. I prayed. I read scripture. I did acts of mercy and justice and gave financially to God. I was faithful in worship and tended to all my spiritual practices more than I ever have. Yet this was still a year with moments of deep sorrow and hardship. And you might think, what good does this all do? It's natural to think that way especially if we see New Year's Day as a starting line or a finish line, as if all our faithful behavior over the prior year should have produced some blessing to us. And then when we don't see those benefits, we might become jaded or cynical or even discouraged about remaining a faithful Christian. And here we remember the words of Jeremiah in our scripture reading today. As God said to the Israelites and to us, that God is making a new covenant with us embedded in our hearts. It means that we might not see the fruitfulness of our faithfulness right now because we're so close to it in the present moment. But God has a different sense of time, one that views our lives in the widest possible lens. And over time, as our faithful choices meet the faithful love of God, we can see transformation taking place. And it means that your hardship is not permanent. Your suffering is not your life sentence. You're simply called to be faithful. And God will be faithful to work in you in ways that you cannot see right now. I shared this in my Christmas Day message last week, but I want to share it with you again in case you missed it. And because it's also relevant for today, I once had a therapist years ago give me a nugget of insight that forever changed my perspective on life. She told me of a study that revealed that on average, a person's stage and situation in life changes dramatically every five years or so. It means that whatever kind of life you're living right now, whatever unique combination of joys and hardships that you're carrying right now, it is not permanent. Five years from now, your life will be different in ways that you cannot predict. Just as your life was different five years ago from the life you're living now, and different from 10 years ago and 15 years ago and so on. And you know what? She's been right, just as I'm sure it's been true for you. 
Five years ago, my life was before the pandemic. And how different was life back then? So much of my life and ministry and perspective has changed over these past five years. Ten years ago, I was living in Iowa. I had no idea whether I'd be living there for the rest of my life or whether I'd ever be coming home to Florida. What I knew is that my daughters were young and their mother and I had just separated. The burdens of my life felt so heavy and insurmountable. Exactly 15 years ago was the year my family and I decided to leave Hyde Park in Tampa and my family in St. Petersburg to move to Iowa. And there was so much anxiety and uncertainty about that move, which, which turned out to be great and amazing in so many ways, but we didn't know that back then. 20 years ago, I had just become a new parent. Grace was about a year old, and everything about our lives changed once she was born. It was a new set of uncertainties and challenges, as well as joys. Exactly 25 years ago, I became a minister in the United Methodist Church. I was very green, very inexperienced, very apprehensive, very naive, and very excited about what the future would hold for me. My stage in life was very different 25 years ago. And 30 years ago, I was in college, still thinking I was going to be a doctor, still wrestling over my faith. And that year, I had just met a woman who would eventually become my wife and the mother of our two girls. I could go on. 35 years ago, I was in middle school. We will not speak of my middle school years. Or my elementary or preschool years, 40 or 45 years ago. And then, a week from this Monday, I turned 50. The big 5-0. So that's something. Every five years, your situation in life changes. For the better, and sometimes for the worse, but never forever. This is why we are called to be faithful to God every day. Not because our faithful actions will suddenly make our lives better, but because God is faithful every day. And God works to transform us in a way that is gradual and continuous and relentless. As I said last Sunday, maybe the transformation at work in your life is less like turning on a floodlight and more like how the daylight gradually grows longer after the winter solstice or how the sun rises in stages until the dawn is unmistakable or how the room gradually grows brighter as more and more candles get lit one at a time. So maybe the essential character of New Year's Day is not that somehow with the turn of a daily calendar that all our problems will go away if we just do all the right things. Being faithful to God does not mean that everything is instantaneously going to be okay. God sees the whole of your life through a broader lens than you can see in the moment, but you will begin to see transformation in retrospect. The long winters of suffering that you went through five years ago, 10, 15, 20 years ago, may have seemed insurmountable at the time, but you see now that they were just temporary. And in those years, when you rang in the new year and thought about the year behind you, you may have thought that your faithful discipleship made no difference at all. But God was faithful, and transformation was happening, just more subtly and inconspicuously than you could notice at the time. God is at work in our hearts, as Jeremiah says. God's faithfulness is not just powerful, but it's persistent, even if it seems imperceptible. All you have to do is remain faithful. For our prayer to conclude our sermon, I invite us to join in offering this prayer written by John Wesley and is commonly recited at the start of a new year. Let's pray. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly 
yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. I hope this message gave you some new ways to think about how God can work in the world and in your life in this upcoming year. Down in the notes are some reflection questions to help you continue processing this content. And if you want to talk about this message with other people or join us in worship, visit hydeparkumc.org slash next steps to find out more. We'll see you next time.